I'd like to call the city council meeting to order. Roll call, please. Alderman Catalano. Here. Alderman Jacob. Here. Alderman Lazaro. Here. Alderman Sabarski. Here. Alderman E. Wesley. Here. Alderman R. Wesley. Here. Alderman Ware. Here. Alderman Woods. Here. Alderman Pulido. Here. Alderman Ware. Here. Alderman Woods. Here. Alderman Ware. Alderman Woods. Here. Alderman Ware. Here. Here. I declare quorum present. Please stand and join in the Pledge of Allegiance. Maybe, Joe, you want to lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. To any citizen, oh wait, hold on once. Approval of minutes, city council meeting, May 15, 2014, I need a motion. So moved. Second. Any corrections? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion. One abstention? Abstain? One abstention. Okay. Do any citizens wish to be heard on matters not listed on this agenda? I guess I can call. I call this, right? Should I call this? No. Well, I don't know what he wants, though. As Jim, yeah. well, no, no, wait, I got Jim McConaughey. McConaughey. Yes. Is this you? Yes. Would you please go to the microphone, state your name? and Sure. Thank you. Yeah, but if it's on the consent of Jim, you said he wants to take it off. Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor and Board. Um, I'm here tonight to, um, sure. I apologize for the oversight of not getting you this material before the board meeting but I am here on the um, consent agenda for the awarding of the contract to Kim Construction. I have um, some documentation here for the board and it shows a prevailing wage violation notice, a determination, and there's also a notice of first violation and there's also the last page is the page for the uh, Department of Labor to contact them to see if there's any other um, outstanding um, violations that are pending or have been, you know, presented to them. So that's why I was here tonight to uh, address this issue. Could you please state your name and what organization you use for the clerk? Yes. So My name is Jim McConaughey. I'm with the Labor Management Cooperation Committee. Right. Got that, Shirley. Mr. Bond, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, the, uh, the city undertook a, a bid process um, and we had a, um, our engineer did the screening of those, right, Jeff? Yeah, RJN, RJN uh, went through those and as part of the screening process, they look into uh, the references, they look into compliance with the bid requirements, the bid specifications, and um, has made a recommendation. Uh, my assumption is those matters are public record that they've taken into consideration, um, the items that, uh, that Mr. McConaughey has is, uh, is, um, indicated here, so. Would the board be interested in looking at these documents, per se? Go ahead, Mr. Bond. Yeah, if you want to present those to the uh, clerk, and then sure. the clerk can uh, distribute those to the, uh, to the board members. And if, uh, if there's a desire on the part of the uh, council, if you're inclined to approve, the awarding the contract, you can approve it subject to final attorney review and approval, and we can uh, look through these documents and see. And if there is something that would disqualify Kim Construction, then uh, we would advise the uh, the council of that. Alderman Lazara. Jim. Yes. Are you pro or con on this? Are you? Uh, is that a question you can ask? Me? Hold on, Frank. Hold on. Can Mr. I ask Bond. that question? Um, yeah, I mean, it's public comment, so he, you know, certainly can in, uh, indicate if, if he's interested in the city passing the, or approving the contract or not, but it shouldn't, there shouldn't be an inquiry of the, uh, of the public member speaking. So we can't ask that question? Or? Correct. No, okay. Um, if, if this goes through, Pat, um, does this disqualify this vendor? Mr. Bond. 
Um, it depends. It, it may. There's a, there's a threshold, um, you know, if it was, and I don't know the circumstances. I'm just looking at this now uh, for a uh, first violation. And if they've been remedied, uh, obviously they are required to pay prevailing wage. Uh, and sometimes these uh, occur because paperwork hasn't been submitted. Uh, sometimes they occur because prevailing wage was not being, uh, was not being paid. So um, I'll look into that and see. It's it doesn't automatically disqualify them, those, in, in response to your question. Okay. Thank you. All right. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes, yeah, so it's too fast. This gentleman's from what organization? Labor Management Cooperation Committee. And what are they? Well, you know what Mr. I'm represented by the Construction Labor Sister Council. Union. The union. The right. union. Okay. But this Thank is, you. I'm not here as a, as a union issue though. This is about a prevailing wage issue I'm here for. We do, in my department, we do monitoring of prevailing wage jobs. And if we, then we take it and we submit it to the Department of Labor to see if they, if they determine that a prevailing wage violation has been, has, has occurred or not. And so this is what I'm here about. I'm here about a prevailing wage issue. This is nothing as far as a union issue. Uh, whether it's union, non-union, it doesn't matter to me. I just care that the contractor pays prevailing wage. And like I said, he has a determination of not paying prevailing wage in 2011. He's got a notice of first violation in 2013 of not paying prevailing wage. So there's somewhat of a pattern there. Okay, I just, right. I just wanted to know where you were from. Okay, no problem. Oh, I'm sorry, I had one more question. Yeah, I just actually two quick ones. Uh, is Kim Construction Union Shop? Mr. Bond. Yeah, it, it wouldn't matter, I think, as, uh, as Mr. Conaghy indicated. They're required under our statute and under state, state law to pay prevailing wage. Okay, and how long has Kim Construction been in business? Does anyone know? Matt, you know? Jeff? No. We, we don't have that handy, but like the, it's on the consent agenda. But we pull it off the, you can pull it off the consent agenda and make the motion, as the attorney said, with the attorney review. Okay. And that would give me an opportunity then to, uh, okay. you know, to determine whether or not this would uh, be cause for disqualification. And uh, I can check with our JN to make, see what, uh, you know, make sure that their due diligence included this, which I assume it did, generally would. Alderman Eugene Wesley. Well, that, that was my concern. I, I suggest that we pull this off the consent okay. agenda. When we, get to the, when we get to that point, we'll, we'll do that. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We also have uh, Mr. Joe Butis would like to say a few words. Joe. That way. Better read it upside down. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Most of you know who I am, but the others that don't know me, that's okay, I don't want to swallow it. <laughs> uh, most of you know me, like I said, and some don't know me. And I'm Joe Butis. I live on 156 Oakwood. I moved here in 1958, and I think next week I'll be leaving. So I sold my house and I'm going to go to Roosevelt for a little bit. But I'm here tonight not to talk about that, but to say thank you to the mayor, all the city council members, Chief Greg Vesta, all of his police department, <coughs> Fire Chief Tim Roca, and his department, and the city works department for all our outstanding help for making this year's Memorial Parade a great success. They did a lot of work on the streets, they did a lot of work over there at the staging area, at the memorial, they did a lot of work, and I want to say thank you. I will be not doing the next ones because I'm gonna get somebody and I will be training them. I will show them what to do. I'll be by his side all the time. But at the next parade, I wanna be on the reviewing stand instead of at the back end of the parade, getting everybody out. <laughs> but that's my thing right now and I wanted to say thank you because without the city council and the city works and everything else, the police department, you can't run a parade in town. That's impossible. So this was a good one. Uh, I think I'm going out with a nice smile. So I want to thank the city council for your help, and I'm glad that everybody, whoever saw the parade, enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we thank you, too. Mayor. Mayor. And, and we'll see you next year, right, Joe? <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. I know you, yeah. you said that before, but no, no, I, we know you're going to be running it. I'm halfway to 91 <laughs> right now. That's enough. A young 91. A young 91. I'm going out to pasture. I'm going out to pasture right now. Wait, wait, hold on. <laughs> Alderman, wait, wait. Mrs. Marsky, you want to say we, something? Go ahead. Before you go, we'd like to, or I'd like to say, that for being an outstanding role model and <coughs> citizen of this town and taking everything on like you do, thank you very much for your time and effort. It's, it's a consolidated effort in the city, but you put the most time in out of anybody and your, your efforts show. So thank you for all your help. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you, Joe. Do any other citizens wish to address the council? Okay. Written communiques. I have one from uh, Fenton High School on behalf of the academic team. They want to thank you for the contribution for the sponsorship. And that takes care of it and communiques. Under mayor's report, first item, uh, the Wooddale Charity Ball. There was a, an, a kickoff meeting about three weeks ago. Some of the organizations came together. Addison gave us a presentation and explained uh, basically what was involved, what's entitled, and all the organizations actually went back to their groups to see if they wanted to participate or not. Here, for us, if we want to participate, the young lady from Addison said it took about 25% of her staff time, is what she said. Uh, basically, that included uh, invitations, getting all the invitations together, making sure only one invitation per person went out instead of, you know, like some people would get three or four if each organization invited them. Uh, then the handling of the money and basically the disbursement of the funds as well. We could, if we want to go forward, we could uh, could do some of the grunt work ourselves. Uh, Alderman Jacobs and Alderman Carolina were at that initial meeting. I go, guys, if you want to work on the invitation stuff, I'll be more than happy to work with them just to alleviate some staff time. And then staff would just be, once we get the list, they would mail it out. And then as far as collecting the funds, naturally it would have to be the staff collecting funds and disbursement. There wouldn't be any council members. I'll depend if you guys want to go forward. I need a consensus. We do have another meeting set up next week to see if those committees even want to go forward. There wasn't even a for sure, but we should at least know if we want to go forward. Alderman Eugene Wesley, go ahead. I, I have one question. Um, the organization, I don't remember seeing a list of organizations that attended that meeting. The other question I have for you is what is it going to cost the city to start this, kick this thing off? I mean, and, and what account will it come out of? I mean, how, how much money are we talking? I know we probably got front at first. How much are we talking here, man? You know, they really, they really didn't give us a, an exact dollar amount. They said we would have to put a down payment on the banquet hall, depending how, depending what, which banquet hall. I don't know. I'm probably thinking a three, four thousand, maybe five. But the city becomes reimbursed as the tickets are sold. And we have the two of the aldermen here that were there. What if, what if they don't sell those tickets to reimburse the city for the project? Well, each group has to sell at least one table. That's why the initial meetings, you know, they're going to say how many tables they're going to, you know. So you might get a banquet hall for, Addison said I think their first one was under 100 people, if I remember correctly. Right? Do, do we have a list of organizations? I could uh, name them. Uh, I should have gave them to Jeff. It was the Knights Columbus, Child's Voice, the Historical Society, Wooddale Education for Excellence, Lions Club. Am I missing anybody? Knights of Columbus. Knights of Columbus. I said Knights of Columbus and the Lions Club and the Chamber of Commerce. Alderman Woods. Yeah, I was uh, the last meeting I was out of town, so I wasn't able to make that. You said we we're going to have another meeting. Could we have that meeting and then maybe we could throw these questions out there and kind of get some stuff on a piece of paper to, to agree, given all the questions everybody's asking. 
And I'm pretty much in favor of it, but I'd like to know if there's you know, a couple more parts and pieces. Okay, we, we could. We could post a meeting. It's uh, going to be next week, the 17th, at 7 p.m. Want to post that meeting this way, council members? Right, we did post. We did post the last one. Took some minutes. I gave it to the manager. It's Tuesday the seventeenth at seven p.m. Sure. Go ahead, Alderman Wesley. So there was minutes for this first meeting already. Go ahead, Mr. Mermis. Yeah, I just got the minutes today, and I'm putting them in the packet tomorrow for you because I know you're going to want to read them. I can give them to you tonight. I just got them. I didn't think you'd want to read them tonight. I mean, I, I'm for it, but I like to see the minutes and see what it's about. I, I took the minutes because naturally we didn't bring in any staff. And being that was kind of chicken scratch, I, I fixed it up real nice for the manager yesterday morning so he could present it to you guys. Wendy still got to type it out. We, we couldn't decipher it all. So oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Alderman Jacob. I was at the meeting, and, and I'm all for this. Uh, my concern was that the person that said 25%, that was a person um, in a pretty high position in the city. So, I mean, if you took her salary, I mean, we're probably talking $25,000 of her time was donated to this. I mean, I, I think it was more than doing invitations and stuff. So, I mean, one of my suggestions at that meeting was to maybe look at some kind of planner or somebody that might be cheaper. I know we kind of talked about finance, collecting the money, but now we're short staffed in finance. So I mean, we, we kind of got to take all that into account and consider all that. Actually, there was one other thing, Mr. Bond, before the meeting we were talking a little bit, and he had mentioned something they did in Bensonville where they hired somebody to handle it with the organizations and they took basically a commission of whatever was raised. Mr. Bond, I don't know if you want to Yeah, they, they hired essentially an event planner. The event planner took, uh, took a percentage of the gross uh, monies that were generated, so it ended up costing the village of Bensonville uh, nothing for, that, for those services. So her services were reimbursed from the, uh, from the proceeds of the event. So they didn't use staff time. She had her own staff. She took care of, I think the only thing she needed was, because you guys had the contacts, the agencies and organizations have people that, you know, they would like to invite there. So, you know, she, her and her staff utilized the contacts from the uh, organizations and from the village. And then they went ahead and did everything from the invitations to the decorations to securing the venue to, you know, they did a couple, they sold commemorative bricks, they sold sponsorships, they did a lot of different things to raise money. It was a, a pretty, pretty big success. You had a follow up, Alderman Jacob? Go ahead. Yeah, I guess all I'm saying is I, I'd not like to maybe look into something like that as, and, and maybe even the city pay for it as part of our contribution to it, because otherwise it would cost one of our staff members, you know, if it is truly 25% of someone's salary, the person in Addison is probably making about 80000 a year, which is 25% of that salary is pretty high. I think to donate that money towards an event planner might be <coughs> worth, worth looking into. All right, well, we'll have the meeting next week, then we'll bring it back to you the following the council meeting. <coughs> Alderman Lazar, go ahead. With the, uh, the organizations that are participating um, in this event, do we know how much last year combined that we actually gave these organizations? No, we didn't total that up. <coughs> I mean, I know Is that a way we the can Historical Society, we gave some money to uh, Wooddale for Education for Excellence. Yeah. We received some money. Yeah, if we can get, get go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, the, Mr. the big one every year is the Historical Society. That's the big chunk of it. The other ones are $500 here, $300 there, $1,500 there. Can we total oh, Brad, that what's the estimate? Yeah, we can get you a total. Yeah, if we can total that number, I would All like right. to see that. We'll, we'll get it for you for next time. 20. Brad says thirteen on average, thirteen thousand. Thirteen thousand. All right. Next is uh, we did have uh, had a resignation on the stormwater committee. 
Mike Penisnack, they are moving out of town. So we need a motion to approve Marge Calva for filling the unexpired term until April 30th, 2016. I need a motion. I made that motion. Second. Motion and second. Alderman Eugene Wesley. Mr. Mayor, I just have a question. I have no problem with feeling a position, but in our stormwater commissioner's ordinance that we have, 3.401, it states here that there's a nine member resident, nine people on that board. Also, these terms are, three of them are for three years, three of them are for two years, and three of them are for one year. And also reading into this, it also shows that we should have an alderman, I mean, not an alderman, but we should also have one from each ward. Needless to say, due to the fact that this is coming down, we have no representation in Ward 4 at all. Now, are we following our ordinance on this issue here, or are we not following our ordinance? The point is, we don't have anyone for the fourth ward at all. So I suggest if you want to do that, then you might well bring, I, I know you were concerned about duplicating people on committees. So I would ask that we go ahead and look at, if we have to duplicate, at least get a representative for it to work. If I don't have anyone that comes forward, we should just have some, because it's in our ordinance that one should be represented from each ward. And also it shows a nine board member, and it's right here in our ordinance number four, section 3.401, so it's the ordinance. So. I have no problem of this person coming on board, but we also need to look at our ordinance that if we're going to dissolve that. That's it. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Bryant. Yeah, the, uh, uh, Alderman Wesley is uh, correct with respect to the membership and appointment. The stormwater, the voting members of the stormwater commission shall be nine residents of the city. Uh, the appointments shall be made by the mayor with the advice and consent of the city council. In determination of such appointments, consideration shall be given to the geographic location of the residents of the appointee so that the entire territory of the city may have representation on the commission. So, um, you know, goal, obviously, if you can accommodate and get a representative each ward, but the, the, the ordinance requires there to be uh, representation uh, throughout geographically throughout the uh, city's <coughs> boundaries. Okay, well, the reason I chose this person we had a flooding over at uh, Georgetown. She lives in Georgetown. Uh, as far as the previous committees, I mean, I've only re replaced a couple people on that committee. So I, I'm just, so I haven't, uh, go ahead, Alderman Ray Wesley, follow up then. So Mr. Mayor, on that consideration, are you withdrawing your, <coughs> your nomination so if you guys want somebody from uh, ward four i guess i think uh, we would have to if we're going to follow you have you have somebody uh you'd like to bring forward go ahead mr Alderman mayor i Wesley. believe there's two vacancies on that board isn't there no one how many how many do we have on the board now <laughs> i don't have it with me i didn't i never added one or subtracted one that's the way the the amount has been if somebody stepped down we replaced them so go ahead so miss there was only Mr. one Bond, don't we have to follow our ordinance or could the mayor bring someone up and not follow our ordinance mr bond no of course you have to follow the ordinance what i'm saying is the ordinance says consideration shall be given to the geographic location of the residents of the appointees so you're, you're not mandated to have one from every ward. Uh, you are mandated to have representation geographically throughout the, uh, throughout the city. So, so go ahead, follow up. So again, I'm trying to figure that. Again, Mr. Mayor, I'm asking you if you would like to withdraw your, your appointment or you, would you like to take this to a vote? I would take it to a vote. I mean, she's in a flooding area. I don't have a problem with that, but unless you want to. Mr. Mayor, hold that one second. I'm trying to write all the names down. Oh. 
Go ahead, Mr. Bond. Yeah, it, it, maybe I wasn't clear. When the language I read is straight out of the uh, code, and while it, the goal is geographic location, it doesn't mandate a appointment from each of the wards under our code. Oh, Eugene Wesley, go ahead. But our ordinance also says it's a nine board member. It also says it's three years, two years, and one year term. That's our that ordinance. To start. I understand your point. I have no problem voting for this tonight, but we need to look at if we're going to get rid of this ordinance because according to that ordinance, we have, should have a nine member board. Okay, and it also states in there, which I, someone's looking at, also these terms are staggered. And I believe our terms are not staggered to our terms. Wait, that was for the first appointment. After that, they're three years, so they're staggered. Are they staggered? One gets three years, one gets two years, and one gets a year? When they initially formed the committee, that was three years, two years, and one year. So then when they're reappointed, the people at the end of the one year got three-year term. So what about the nine-member board that we are required in our ordinance? We don't have nine members. Three, no, we got, we have eight. We've always had eight as far as I've been on the council. Uh, I understand, uh, and I agree of putting this person on. My concern is if we got to follow our ordinance, we need to follow our ordinance. If you want to change the ordinance, so eighth board, if you right. want to change the ordinance. You have another eight, resident from the ward, fourth ward that you'd no, like to bring I, I forward? I told you I don't have anyone, but the point is when we choose to dismantle a one per committee, there was one on the fourth ward that was on our stormwater committee because we choose or, or you choose to hire one person for each committee. No, 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 no. We used to have duplicate people on committees. People on two and three committees. Right. So to give more people in town a chance to contribute, I ask that we have one person on one committee so instead of being on two and three committees. That's what I did. But as far as being somebody in Ward 4, there was, honestly, there was, I don't remember anybody coming off of Ward 4. Roy Sun For, came off of Ward 4. Oh, that's true. Oh, right, right. Roy was your Ward 4. He was, right. But he stayed on CDC. I gave him a choice. He wanted to stay on CDC. Well, we can add one person if the code says nine. I left it at eight because it was at eight for as, ever since I've been on the council. That's what it's been. All right. I said we need to make changes on the ordinances, and I don't know. We kind of pushed that aside. There were some things that needed to be cleaned up. I know Jeff is going to say we are working on it. He has Jeremy working on it. Because I have been complaining about that. Some of the things, I mean, we did make the one change for uh, stormwater. It had to be a specific chairman of a committee. We made that change. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things. We can, go, we can go through the whole ordinance, and I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that was put in 40 years ago, 30 years ago, that's really garbage right now. You want to make a all, all, I'm, all I'm asking is, I have no problem approving this person tonight. All I'm asking is for you, Mayor, is, if, 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 if someone in fourth ward comes to us and wants to be on that stormwater committee in the next appointment, even though he's already on one committee or her on the same committee in the city, that person should have the option to go on two committees if we can't get anyone from the fourth ward. I, it suffered, the fourth ward is the one that's gonna be suffering on this committee now. I don't care how you look at right, well, it because look. we have flooding issues in our town in, in, in fourth ward too. So I'm a, I have no problem proving this appointment tonight, but I'm just asking on the next appointment that you reconsider, if we go to nine people, that you really consider if someone wants to serve on two committees, that they're entitled to serve on two committees. Thank you. Alderman Woods. I just wanted to address that probably nine makes sense. I mean, eight's an even number. I mean, it, it should be an odd number, whether that number's nine or seven, but. So can we bump it up to nine? Does that make sense? Well, after tonight, I'll make sure I look for somebody in the fourth ward. Give, yeah, Eugene a chance to 
I never paid attention to the wards. For me, it's one city, one community. Uh, right. I'm just, I'm just the people at that, uh, you know, honestly, the night that uh, I got this resignation, and I know Alderman Jacobs didn't hear me, but because we were talking about it, Alderman Catalano said he had a couple of people from Georgetown, fine. I, we had an issue over there that, you know, they seem to feel we have a switch over here that we can turn the water and once it rains, we have a switch. We'll let them come on the committee and become, become educated. So, no problem, I'll find you another person. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any other questions? Roll call. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Zimarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? Yes. Alderman R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Wood? Yes. That passes. That concludes my report, City Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just two items. First, uh, the city's got a scheduled gypsy moth spring uh, tomorrow. Um, a reverse 911 did go out. We have a second gypsy moth spring scheduled for June 13th, uh, weather dependent. Um, so those residents that see a helicopter flying around town, it is the gypsy moth application. Um, second item, I will um, defer to representatives from ComEd who are here to give a uh, brief presentation about their smart meter program. Mayor, can I ask about the gypsy moth before we move on? So Go ahead, ask a question. You, where's the area they're going to be spraying? Mr. Mermis. Matt, do you have uh... Yeah, there's, uh, it's the same areas as last year. So there's an area just to the north of City Hall, um, an area um, east of the creek, and south to Carter between the creek and Wooddale Road, south to where Carter extends out. And then um, like Montrose uh, west, or excuse me, east of um, like right around the Iroquois and south all the way to the end of uh, like Montclair. Yeah. Same route as last year. Yes, same route as last year. That's it, Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Good. Police and City Manager Jeff Marmis and distinguished members of the City Council. Thank you once again for allowing us to be here this evening. Um, tonight I am joined by members of our Smart Meter, AMI Smart Meter team. Um, you're going to hear a presentation from the Vice President of the Smart Meter team, Mike McMahon, and we certainly have with us customer advocate um, Tom Potulska. Protelski and our intern extraordinaire, Lauren Grant. So without further ado, I would like to bring forward at this time, Mike McMahon, who will take us further. Uh, thanks very much. My name is Mike McMahon. I'm the vice president for AMI implementation uh, for ComEd. So uh, ComEd is in the process of deploying the smart meters across our entire 11,500 square mile service territory. Uh, we began full-scale deployment in uh, September in 2013. Uh, we got about 70,000 meters in uh, that year. So far this year, we've got about another 130,000 meters installed. Uh, most of those have been down in uh, Chicago South. We're opening up a new, uh, what we call cross-dock facility, which is basically a dispatch center in Bensonville, where we'll be dispatching and installing our meters throughout this general uh, area right now. We've got about 450 or so meters already installed in Wooddale. We're going to put about 4,500 meters in this year, and then we'll be back next year to uh, finish the uh, commercial meters in Wooddale. I have a map that shows our uh, distribution and where we'll be when, if I can uh, approach Sure, just hand it to the clerk, and she'll make sure we get, some co get a copy. So the map basically shows you where we'll be uh, installing the meters. Uh, you might ask, well, why don't you just start at one end of town and work to the other end of town? <clears throat> it has to do with the way the meters are read. So you can't really swap a meter out within about uh, plus or minus five days of when a meter is read. Otherwise, we can't, uh, we'll screw up the bill and we can't get the bill out on time. So there's kind of a dead period there. So that's why we bounce around a little bit uh, to accommodate the billing cycle. As I said, we'll put about 5,500 meters in uh, Wooddale uh, this year. 
Uh, the smart meter is bringing a uh, whole range of benefits to our customers as part of the broader Energy Infrastructure Modernization Act passed by the Illinois General Assembly in October of 2011. Uh, about a billion dollar investment on our part just for the smart meters across the service territory. Once we get those meters in, uh, we won't have to read the ma readers manually anymore. That means we don't have to go in people's yards. We have about 35% of our meters are actually in people's homes. We won't have to go in their homes anymore. That's a big benefit. We'll reduce our estimated bills. The customers will be able to see their uh, energy usage on an hour interval the day after. We also have a peak time savings program that will be uh, eligible for signups uh, this fall, where if you use less energy than we expect you to do on that peak time day, uh, you'll get a credit on your bill. And then it also opens you up to different kinds of savings alternatives. Um, the meters themselves, you might ask, well, what makes a smart meter smart? Uh, here's the, uh, if you'd like to see them, I, I can hand one around. Um, this is a regu regular old meter. Here's your new meter right here. It has a digital readout. Would you? With your permission, I'll approach sure, you. Can sure, sure. We'll show and tell here. You can start at that end, actually. Here's the old one. There's the new one. And since those are more efficient, naturally, it's cheaper for the residents. Correct? Uh, the savings at, over the 20 year, over a 20 year lifetime, we had an independent analysis done, and the customers will save over $2 billion net savings over cost over a 20 year time period. A lot of that savings comes from the fact that we don't employ uh, manual meter reading anymore. We also are able to reduce what's called consumption on inactive meters, which is currently socialized across the rate base. That's when people move out of their homes or apartments. We typically leave that power on right now because it's less expensive to leave it on than dispatch a, uh, a line truck to disconnect them. And we also reduce theft as well. So oh, well over $2 billion net savings due to the smart meter deployment to the customers over a 20-year time period. Uh, we have uh, what makes a smart meter smart. There's a small computer chip inside it which uh, stores data. Uh, the smart meters only transmit their information six times a day, once every four hours. Total on time for the radios and a smart meter is less than five minutes a day. There's a lot of dialogue out there that says meters transmit continuously, they do not. The total on time for a meter is only about five minutes a day. In fact, it's less than that. Uh, a lot of studies use five minutes, so we kind of stick with that number. Uh, there's two small radios in a smart meter. Uh, one transmits to us, 900 megahertz band, about the same power as a uh, garage door opener or a baby monitor. And once again, total on time, less than five minutes a day. And then there's another radio in the, in the uh, smart meter, which is only turned on if it's enabled by the customer, so the customer can communicate with the smart meter through various uh, devices called in-home devices. And uh, I'll just pause there for uh, any questions. We're glad to be in Wooddale. We're glad to be bringing the benefits of the smart meters to our customers and your citizens. Alderman Lazara. Mike. Uh when these first started coming out, I was hearing um, that they were catching fire. Mm -hmm. and, uh, is this, what generation is this of the smart meter now? And I would think that by now you would have probably have solved that. Yeah, we had a pilot. Uh, we started out with a pilot where we collaborated with state agencies and stakeholder groups. And the pilot ran in 2009, 2010. Uh, when what, what we call their innovation quarter, which is basically both sides of the Eisenhower, uh, Oak Park, that general area. And uh, what we found was the meters are new. So the smart meters, when they go in, are new. The socket, and we own the meter. ComEd owns the meter. The socket the meter goes in is typically the age of the house, and that's owned by the homeowner. That is not owned by uh, ComEd. What we saw was the meter's new, the socket is not. So we did have three occurrences over a, a two-year time span, uh, ending in 2010, where there were three uh, small fires. Uh, you know, if you look at the pictures, 
There was smoke damage on the side of the building. Nothing actually burst into flames, but I didn't want to get cute with the language, so we called them fires. Uh, that was vetted with the uh, ICC, and what we found was it wasn't the meters. We had the meters tested by two independent agencies. Uh, we had a thorough investigation of this, and what we found was it had to do with uh, some wiring in the socket on a particular type of socket, a particular type of socket which we call an A-base meter, which is very early generation uh, meters. So we did a couple things on that. Um, we um, have now got UL certified uh, socket replacements for those A-base meters. There's a block and there's an adapter. Both of those are UL certified now. Uh, we monitor the temperature of the meters daily several times. So one of the features of a smart meter is it has a temperature sensor in it. And you can scan that meter to see what the temperature is. So we monitor every meter we have at about 0, 0,500 every single morning. And we trend that over, over the life of the meter to see if there's any unusual trends, to see if we can see any temperature, temperature changes. Uh, there have been a few occasions where we've gone out. We've had an anomaly and we've gone out. And actually, it's turned out in most cases that's been due to theft, some sort of theft going on. And you'd be amazed what people do to steal electricity with the meter. Um, so uh, we scan the meters daily, temperature sensors. We will dispatch a trouble man if we have any indication of that. And now we've employed uh, our elect electricians on standby. So one of the corrective actions we took was we trained all our installers on how to inspect the socket. So when an installer goes up, he inspects, regardless of whether it's one of these problematic uh, sockets or whether it's just a normal socket, he's trained to uh, pull the meter and inspect the socket. And if he notices anything off with the socket, uh, he will call, we have an electricians on standby with one hour show up time, and those electricians will come out and make repairs to that particular socket. Uh, we're down in Chicago South right now. It's an older part of town, of course. We get about 11 a day. We're doing about 11 socket repairs a day. No cost to the customer. That gets uh, rolled into the cost of the program and the rates. One of the things I like to point out to folks is there's a couple things uh, ComEd will not do. Uh, we will always have identification. In your area, Corex, our subcontractor Corex, will be installing the meters. And their trucks are clearly labeled Corix, C-O-R-I-X, and their trucks are labeled ComEd. They're, they wear Corix equipment. We tell you this in our pre-deployment literature. They have Corix hard hats, and they have a yellow ID, uh, blue ID badge identifying them as a ComEd contractor. If anybody asks for, uh, for that ID badge, and we encourage people to do that, and they don't show it, it's not us. Close the door, call the police. That's what we like to say. Now, you might imagine on the south side of Chicago, safety is maybe a little more paramount than in other spots. So if they don't have a badge, if they're not willing to show you the badge, even if they have their equipment on, then they're not us. There's someone else out there pretending to be us. And we will never ask for money. Nobody will ever ask for money at the door. We're not gonna ask for any money. So if somebody does, it's not us, Close the door, call the police, it's not us. Yes, sir. I thought they don't even have to come in the house, they just go through the back and change out the meter. Well, there's, there's several uh, homes that, uh, surprisingly number, that actually have the meters on the inside of the home. Oh, they okay. tend to be oh typical the meters homes. are on the inside, okay. But if the meter's on the outside of the house, uh, we have no reason to go inside the home at all. Now, our installation process is, uh, we will now you're a little bit accelerated now. We're, we're working on an accelerated plan right now uh, We're a little we're kind of a little bit over our skis because the accelerated plan is due to be approved by the ICC uh, June 11th next week, uh, but we're progressing in that way So our typical communication material is is we will put a bill insert talking about smart meters 90 days in advance 60 days in advance we send out a postcard uh, 30 days in advance, there's a letter, and that's signed by myself, that says you will have a smart meter in the next uh, 30 days, 45 days actually. 
but typically it's within 40, 30 days. And it says we will be there either as ComEd or as Corex or approved a subcontractor. We'll give you what's called a robocall a week in advance, saying we will be there next week to install your smart meter. The day of, the installer will approach the door. He'll knock on the door to announce his presence and he'll engage the customer, ask any, answer any questions that customer may have, and then proceed to uh, exchange the meter. If the customer is not home and the meter is outside and we have access to it, we'll go ahead with the meter exchange. When the meter is exchanged, the installer will hang a, a door hanger on the, on the front door knob saying, congratulations, you have a smart meter, we're telling them we've been there, and uh, giving some details on the smart meters. If they're not home, we'll hang another door hanger called, sorry, we missed you, please call for an appointment, and we'll be back to try to make that exchange. Uh, we have been very successful on our pre-deployment literature. Pretty much across the board, everybody that's getting a meter is not surprised to see the installer show up, and they all expect to, uh, and they all expect to have a meter. Thank you. Any other questions? Alderman Jacob, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Curiosity. Uh, you were talking about the, you know, savings and things. Right. Well, um, I mean, ComEd just the other day was on the news that they're raising their rates, and right. I'm assuming several thousand people are losing their jobs. How are how is that going to be saving everybody money? Uh, two different questions in there. Right. So let me take okay. take them one at a time. Uh, your bill is divided into two pieces. It's a supply charge, and it's a, a delivery charge. The, what you're hearing in the news right now is mostly around the supply charge. And, and you know, we, we don't supply electricity. Uh, we just pass it through from any, in the, from any provider. Now, do you have municipal aggregation here? Yes, we do. Who's your supplier? First Energy right now. First but Energy, okay. So we pass that electricity through. In a similar fashion, if nobody picks an alternate supplier, that electricity is supplied through the Illinois Power Agency, and we pass that through. We don't set the price of electricity, we just pass it through if nobody else is supplying that electricity through municipal ag. Most of what you heard Excuse me. was the supply charges. We'll just stick to the smart meter questions. <laughs> okay, all right. So you said thousands of people will lose their jobs. Uh, there are meter, we will not be required to manually read meters anymore. Manual meter reading is going the way of the buggy whip. We've got about 500 manual meter readers right now. Uh, at the end of the deployment period, we'll have about 40 just to pick up uh, odds and ends. Now, so we are losing jobs. Those savings from the reduction in the workforce get passed on to the consumers the very next year. So we go in for an annual rate case. The savings we realize by deploying the smart meters which include no manual meter readers, uh, fewer truck rolls, because I can now interrogate the meters. We can know if you're uh, on and off individually. It's gonna be a while before we get to a full storm response. They've got a lot of, lot of systems to integrate there. But those savings get passed on to the customers right away. It's actually uh, out in the out years when you do reach a break even. As, as with any large investment, you know, the cost is up front, the benefits come a little later. So, the break-even point is reached, uh, reached in the uh, out years. What are we doing with those 500 jobs, you might ask? Every meter reader on property right now has the opportunity to post and upgrade to a full lineman job. Now, they have to qualify for that. It's a tough job. We get, it takes three years to grow a lineman, but we have committed to offer all our meter readers opportunity to post for another job in ComEd or go to our, one of our core line schools. And in the interim, the installers, the ComEd installers we're using are upgraded meter readers. They're meter readers that have been provided with additional training and we're putting them to work right now, I should say, at a, at a pay raise as well. So, yes, those jobs are going away, but there's lots of notice. People have time to plan. Alderman Eugene Wesley, you were next. I, I have a couple questions. Sure. sure this meter. Yep. The smart meter, how do I know that if you got extra usage of electric through the whole community on the peak hours, on the peak yeah. hours, right. that you aren't going to change the power level in your in, in the residential neighborhood to bring your rating down? If you have an over peak hour, yeah, 
Right. You guys always roll back or black out or start gearing down some stuff. How do I know that you are not going to do that with these smart meters to a resident area? Well, that's an entirely voluntary program. And what you're talking about is a demand response. And we do have some demand response programs. All demand response programs by ComEd are voluntary. So I, I don't know if anybody in this room has it. I do on my house. I signed up for an air conditioning program where during the summertime, they can, ComEd can uh, automatically, on a peak time day, turn off my air conditioner for 15 minutes. I get paid for that but I had to opt into that. I had to voluntarily sign up for that. Just as peak time savings programs, that will be a voluntary program. Now there's no downside to the peak time savings program. You can only make money, and yet you still have, have to opt in and volunteer for that. There's no change at all, except on a volunteer basis. So you, you have already started install, I'm sorry, man. No, no, go ahead. We have already started to install these in, the, in Wooddale already, you said? Got about 500 of them in, yes, sir. And where were those installed already? Uh, well, you see on the map, it's uh, the June area is where we would have begun. Yeah. I, I, just, I just don't, you know, I'm just worried about the smart meters that you guys got complete control of our electric. Uh, we do not. In, in the whole entire thing. I mean, well, it, it control in what sense? I want to. I want to take your question. My, my control is that if if you have a lot of usage of power users right. in the area, you could right. cut our power almost down. Regardless, even if you volunteer, right? Okay, because you guys do blackouts constantly all over the place, and don't tell me we don't. If but, you got an area that's industrial park using right. a lot of electric, Gene. Right. Okay, and and it's next to resident, you're going to do a blackout. We will not. That's a, the, some industrial customers. It's a meter. They can do it either with either Rolling meter. brown out then. Let's call it We do brown. not. We you do don't not. do that anymore. We do not. Okay. The, the, we, do have, uh, we do have programs where industrial customers have signed up voluntarily so that it's, it's called a reduction on a peak time day. We haven't had one in a long time, by the way, because the temperatures have been down. But in these, these programs, and there's two types of programs, we pay customers for this. Uh, there's one program where it says we can dial your energy down at our discretion without notice. Very few people sign up for that, uh, but some industrial customers do. And then there's another program, and this is all called curtailment, that says I need to call you and ask you if I can do that. And if you agree to it, I can curtail your energy usage. Uh, those are all voluntary programs, they're opt-in, and we, and we do not do rolling blackouts or rolling. This is not California. We have plenty of excess capacity. Okay. One, right. one other question on the smart meter. On the, on the meter or yeah, on, on the blackouts? On the meter. Yeah. Okay. My, my other question on the meter, so if the meter, so the meter is going to be ComEd's responsibility regardless. It is. Okay. I'll always, I understand that. So if we feel that we are being overcharged, yep. which I know, but my electric bill is almost every month. Yeah, right. Do you come out and change this if I feel that that, that thing is not even close? Well, in some circumstances that could be. However, one of the benefits of the smart meter is, is you can see exactly what your energy usage is on a daily basis the very next day. You can go on the web, you sign up for an account, you can go on the web, and you can see what your electrical usage is uh, the very next day. We also have what's called a high energy usage alert. Once again, if you sign up through My Energy Tools and ComEd, we will send you a notification that says if you're using more than 30% electricity than you used the year before, we will send you an automatic alert telling you that. Okay. We also have a high energy newsletter, which is to sign up for it. We'll send you a newsletter telling you Please check this. Now, we have had some alerts. We have called people. And in some cases, almost all cases, uh, they're saying, I'm doing a rehab on my house. I'm doing a remodeling job. I know that. Thanks for the call. There was one person that just got a new hot tub, and they were leaving it on 24 7, le leaving the heaters on. So we will be able to help you manage your energy. That's one of the benefits of the smart meters, is you will be able to manage your energy usage better because you'll have more information at your fingertips on how to do that. Okay, thank you. All right. 
a comment that I did receive something in the mail. You got, like you said, the letter. It tells me that at my house we're using about 15 to 20 percent more electricity than my neighbors. Yeah, I think, that's the I old think my one. I think my, my meter my is wrong. My wife hates that one. By the my way. meter is no good. I think yeah. you need to change it. <laughs> okay. Alder and yeah. Woods. Okay, that's part of our energy program. Yep. Yeah. Energy efficiency program. Go ahead. Yeah. My my question is with with all the computerized turning on, turning off. You didn't pick couple concerns come to mind a obviously you could if somebody doesn't pay their bill this is just theoretically uh, on Monday on Tuesday you could turn it off from your office not saying that you will I'm sure there's going to be some procedure but we also know that computers don't always work correctly especially in the broad environment geographic area that we're going to be working in what uh, what things are put in place to stop electricity from inadvertently being turned off and specifically for seniors that maybe have medical issues with sure. oxygen and stuff like that sure. those are my main concerns. Uh, there's a couple questions in okay. there one and this is this is valid today as well if you have a medical condition uh, you can call 1-800-EDISON-1 uh, and we will note that on your account so that uh, what that does for you is is uh, it assists in you know, possibly if you're behind on your bills, you know, we'll, we'll be calling you to talk to you about that. It also puts you at the top of the list during outage restoration. So if you do have a legitimate medical concern where you got to keep that uh, electricity flowing to maintain your health, and, you know, there's, there's certain procedures to do that because I know it probably comes as a shock, but some people may want to game that system. So there are some checks and balances in there. Then we will note that on your account. The meters have... Uh, over a hundred different alarms on them. Right now, if I just have an analog meter, which is one of the ones I passed around, they go bad too. They go bad too, and, and we don't know it. We don't, that analog meter tells us absolutely nothing. If, if the smart meter loses power for any reason at all, it sends us what's called the last gasp alert. So in the highly unlikely, I, won't, I never say never, I'm an engineer, I never say never, and I never say absolutely. But we don't have the, uh, it's called the remote disconnect switch. We do not have that remote disconnect switch operating inadvertently. Um, not to say it can't be operated inadvertently, but it doesn't just do that. It's rigorously tested, goes through many standards, and it's also uh, been tested by UL. It's been cycled like thousands of times to make sure of that. However, if the meter fails for any reason, if you lose power for any reason, this is another benefit of the smart meters, it sends us what's called a last gasp alert. It will send us a signal saying, I am out of power. And then we can interrogate that right away. And that happens today on blue sky days. So if you lose power today on a blue sky day, we can get a, what's called a last gasp alert, and we can dispatch people to investigate that. Uh, we can also do what's called ping the meter. We can send a signal to the meter and we can say, are you on or are you off? Now this is particularly important uh, during storm restoration. So at the end of storm restorations where you're down to the, you know, the, the onesies and the twosies, just a few people out or you have nested outages, we can send a signal out to these meters and ping the meters and we can only send our trucks to those people that are actually out of power. Half of our truck rolls at the end of a power, a power outage are okay on arrival. The lights are already on. With the smart meters, we'll be able to tell in advance. Now, this, this, this is a marriage between what we call uh, AMI, Automatic Meter Infrastructure, and OMS, Outage Management System. These are two very big software programs. We have a four-tier process that we're working through right now that will be fully implemented in 2016 uh, to, to detect outages automatically. So we still want you to call. Today, you have to call. If you have an outage today, you have to call. We will not know if you're out of power if you do not call us. In the future, we will have automatic notification from the smart meter. Today, the functionality we have is our dispatchers can manually ping a meter from their desk, from their desktop. That's a big step forward for us. And it's going to take us the next several years to get the full functionality we're looking for. Follow up there. Yeah. So the next thing, have you tested or have any information on uh, the ability to hack those systems? To do what? 
to hack your system. Yeah. If they're yeah. radio controlled systems yep. that yep. Nope. I can't get great somebody question. driving by, hack it, turn off yep. electric or. Yep. No, it's, it's a great question. There's, there's three primary concerns that you'll, you're going to hear from your residents on smart meters. <coughs> Uh, data security is one. Uh, you will sell my interval data, my hourly usage of my interval data to third parties. Uh, we will not. Uh, but there are third parties that want it. Now, I don't know why they want it, but they want it. Uh, we will not. There's only three conditions in which we'll release the interval data to a third party. Uh, one, we have the direct permission of the customer. Uh, two, it's required by law. Or three, it's anonymous. That is, it's in a group and there's no name and there's no addresses associated with that. One of the nuances that you, you need to look for is uh, municipal aggregation. Uh, some of the aggregators will say that in my contract, I have the, already have the customer's permission to get their interval data from ComEd. Uh, that's, that's somewhat of a question right now. It's working its way through the ICC. It's being litigated right now. But if you're, uh, if you're particularly if you're renewing your contract under municipal aggregation, you might want to look into that and make it clear. Uh, Cybersecurity is the next uh, issue. People can hack into my meter. Uh, we, I will never say you can't hack into anything, right? You'd be silly to do that in this day and age. However, uh, we do employ uh, state-of-the-art cryptographic techniques. We have future-proofed our meters. We can uh, flash upgrade the firmware over the wirelessly and we have extra memory built into the chip so we can always uh, upgrade that. Uh, we test, we hire people to try to hack into our system and when they do that uh, and they do identify any vulnerabilities we will fix it and we do we just don't do this once we do this a couple times a year and then finally even if even if somebody could hack into that meter uh, the only thing they're going to get is a serial number and your kilowatt hour usage. There's absolutely no personal information in that data stream. All that stuff, your account number, your name, your address, that's all married up in our back office systems. So even if they could hack into that meter, they just get a serial number and kilowatt hour usage. And then the final, the final thing you'll hear about from your, some residents, uh, not all, in fact it's very, very few, we have a refusal rate of about 0.16% right now. So very few people actually refuse the smart meter. But the third one is uh, health concerns. Some people believe that the radio frequency emitted from that small radio about the size of a garage door opener or baby monitor uh, has health effects and can cause uh, health effects on them, can cause cancer or something like that. There's been hundreds if not thousands of studies done on this. There's no direct causal linkage been established. Uh, state after state has investigated this uh, and all have come to the conclusion that there is uh, not sufficient evidence to prove that there's any harmful effects due to smart meters and um, there's no cause to change the standards. And I'd be glad to share a couple of those reports uh, with the village. You can have them and peruse them on yourself. Yes, sir. Alderman and Roy Wesley, you're next. Okay. Just a fast answer. Okay. Uh, Don't be a lawyer. I can do that too. Okay. We got a lawyer here that talks. Um, are businesses signed up? Has businesses signed up for the smart meter at all? Well, they will. Okay. I mean, it's we treat them the same. So okay. The large that's it. That's it. That's all I need. <laughs> Thank 7 you. Seven Elevens are different from large commercial industrial. Okay. Alderman, Sign, you're, sign you're me next. up. I got a dumb meter right now. <laughs> Thank you. So um, you, you had touched on it at the end about the health concerns right. because I had a resident that contacted me and they were very sure. concerned about the offset. Sure. So um, I, I have that answer. Secondly, can you talk a little bit about the refusal process? So is an end user um, able to refuse and what is the process? Go ahead. Sure. So anybody, so I don't want to, I don't want to diminish the concern. I mean, people are legitimately, they're concerned. Yeah. There's no scientific basis for them to be, mm -hmm. but they're concerned. We would like to talk to those people. We would like to point them to a lot of third-party information uh, that we have available on our website. We'd like to share the facts with them. And most of those folks change their mind after we uh, talk to them. Um, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. The refusal process. Oh, the refusal process. Uh, say I refuse. 
you can do it at the door with the installer. Uh, after you get the letter, you can call the 800 number and you can say, I refuse. You don't have to give a reason. We will ask for a reason. It really falls into three categories, health effects, uh, data privacy, cybersecurity, and other, which is actually the second largest uh, category. If you refuse a smart meter, then uh, we start a process of trying to educate the, the customer, uh, present the facts to them. Uh, we will send them a letter, uh, and this is all by ICC tariffs, so this is the law. We send them a letter saying we acknowledge your refusal. Uh, there will be a charge of $21.53 for refusing a month for refusing the smart meter, and that charge will go into effect in four months. And then we follow up with another letter in four months identifying that before, uh, before the charge goes on their bill. Now you say, well, why is there any charge at all? Why any charge at all? Because uh, the, the business case, that over $2 billion I talked about earlier, if you, if you keep a dumb meter, then I have to keep, and I have to send out a meter reader yeah. to read just your meter when all your neighbors have a smart meter, and I don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. So the notion is, is the person that causes the cost should pay the cost. The 2153 doesn't cover the cost, it only partially covers the cost. It was established through a uh, litigated hearing with the ICC, and um, that, that's the charge. All right, thank you. Alderman Catalano, you're next. I got to ask this question. Where was it manufactured, the smart meter? Uh, New Current? Hampshire. New Hampshire. Maybe. And? Made in the USA, right? New Jersey. I can't speak of every single oh, no. part in it. I, would, I wouldn't go, but it's assembled in uh, New Hampshire. It's a GE meter. And uh, we will be opening up an assembly plant in uh, the south side of Chicago, on, uh, close to uh, the old uh, slaughterhouse area, um, where uh, the meters will be assembled for use in the state of Illinois. We create about 50 jobs down there <coughs> to be able to do that. All right. Thank you very much. No other questions, Ray? Thank you. Uh, we're here. We're here for you anytime. Just give us a call. We'd like to come out and do anything we can to answer your questions and facilitate this. And thank you for allowing us in with them. Thank you. I had one, one other item, Mr. Mayor. Um, in addition to the helicopters uh, overhead on Friday, we will also have dinosaurs in town on Saturday, June 6th uh, at uh, dusk. We'll have dinosaurs at Movies in the Park. Uh, Jurassic Park will be playing at Town Square, Wooddale, and uh, commercial. So if you see any dinosaurs, uh, it's okay. Don't call, uh, don't call the police. Thank you. Next, we have three items on the consent agenda. We'll need a motion. Uh, do we want to remove that one item that was uh, brought up? Alderman Wesley? Item number three? It's okay. Correct. Okay. I need a motion to approve the two items. I, I make that motion. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. Well, actually, we do need a second on, uh, to remove. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That carries. That's removed. Now we need the motion. Alderman Jacob, you were making a motion. Yeah. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, to remove. Now we need a motion to approve the two items. We have a f one in the roll call. I've got money there. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? Yes. Alderman R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. That passes now. I'll need a motion to approve items one, an ordinance amending section 7.407 of the Municipal Code of the City of Wooddale to revise the local limits of substances contained in wastewater discharge. Item number two, approval <coughs> pay request, partial number two to Institute Form Technologies USA LLC for the sanitary sewer system rehabilitation project year one in the not to exceed amount of $23,868.16. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Questions? Roll call. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman 
Jacob. Yes. Alderman Lazaro. Yes. Alderman Szymarski. Yes. Alderman E. Wesley. Yes. Alderman R. Wesley. Yes. Alderman Winger. Yes. Alderman Woods. Yes. That passes. Next committee chairman reports Alderman Woods planning and zoning. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, one resolution approving an agreement with CSR Roofing Contractors Inc. for the City Hall roof overlay project and the not to exceed amount of $104,014. That is my motion. Do I have a second? Second. Sorry. Questions? Roll call. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? Yes. Alderman R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. That passes. Next, uh, an ordinance approving a request to permit a special use to allow for the construction of a personal wireless service facility at 190 South Wooddale Road. That is my motion. Second. Second. Mike. He was first. That's what I heard. I'll let Roy make the motion. Okay. He made the motion. Alderman Woods made the motion. The second. You asked for a second. Okay. Any questions? Roll call. <laughs> Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Did he say yes. yes, he said yes. Alderman E. Wesley? Yes. Alderman R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. That passes. Next is an ordinance amending section 17.605 of Article 4, Chapter 17 of the City of Wooddale Municipal Code regarding lot development standards. That is my motion. Second. Okay. Any questions on that? Roll call. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? Yes. Alderman R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. That passes. Next is an ordinance authorizing a variation to the accessory structure bulk regulations to allow for construction of a fence at 430 East Potter Street. That is my motion. Second. second. Who was the second? Uh, Peter. 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 Okay, Tony. Okay. Any questions? Alderman Eugene Wesley. I, I have one question. Do they agree? Is that all in here that they're moving that fence and all that? Ms. Hennigan's checking. I heard yes. We'll okay, take that yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Roll call. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? Yes. Alderman R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. That passes. That's the end of my report, Mayor. Thank you. Public Health and Safety, Alderman Roy Wesley? No report. Thank you. Public Works, Alderman Lazaro. Thank you, Mayor. I have one. I have a report and recommendation, landscaping equipment for the streets division. I'd like to turn that over to- Is Matt. that your motion? That is my motion. Do, Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Who was a second? Okay. Go ahead, Matt. Yes, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, guys. Uh, we are here um, asking for a three zero turn um, Kubota ZD326-60R uh, zero turn mowers to be purchased for the streets division. Um, during the budgetary process, we asked for $50,000 um, to enhance our landscaping equipment. Um, this is a purchase of uh, just over $36,800 um, that we need these mowers. Um, they're a vital piece of equipment to uh, maintain the current level of standard of uh, service that we are uh, providing um, without um, renting equipment and borrowing from other divisions within Public Works. So uh, but if anybody would have any questions about these mowers, I'd be more than happy to take those at this time. Okay, before we start that, Matt, I know the other, we gave 50,000 in the budget. You're coming up with 36,805 right now. So. Should we change the motion to a not to exceed amount on that for the three mowers? The, um, yeah, we're okay with that. The yeah, the not to exceed amount for the mowers at the at the thirty six thousand eight hundred and five dollars and twenty cents. We can do that. Alderman Lazaro, change my motion. Alderman Carolina, I'll second you. 
Okay, and my next question was going to be, I know there's other equipment going to be coming forward that's, there'll be small miscellaneous stuff. Yeah, It'll small be miscellaneous 50, stuff. 000. Like we've already bought some weed whackers out of that $50,000. Right. We bought a backpack blower. There's, an, there's some other small things that we're going to Small purchase. purchases. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions on this? Alderman Eugene Wesley. Uh, I have a question. On, you said you already bought weed whackers out of the, the 50000 and a backpack blower. Do we have any idea how much that was the total bill on that? Mr. York? Um, the, yeah, I think it's total about, I think the weed whackers themselves were about 300 or no, excuse me, about $250 a piece. Um, and the backpack blower is 200. So they're, they're small. Smaller and we're going to be under the 50,000, correct? Yes. Yeah. Most definitely we'll stay under the 50,000. You have a follow up, Alderman Wesley? Anybody else? Alderman Roy Wesley. I did look at these mowers. Um, they're very sturdy. I do ask that the public works director make sure that these equipment stays clean because I've seen some of the equipment that the public works has that it looks filthy, a disgrace. So hopefully that these machines will stay clean and maintained in a proper way. Um, I've been at a at other other plant and their the mowers are filled with grass for over a year on top of their belts and stuff. So I think Mr. York's already initiating a new policy. I know he mentioned something about the trucks and the salt and making sure everything's yes. going to be continually yeah, clean. We most definitely correctly. want to make sure that these last uh, these pieces of equipment last as long as possible. We're not. I don't want to come back to you next year or in two years asking for the same thing over and over again. So uh, we, for my own self. Uh, Thank you. Self worth. That's okay. Do we have, you have a, a follow up? Do we have a motion? We have a motion and a second. Any other questions? Alderman Peter Jacobs. Just one question. Uh, how long will these are these expected to last? Mr. York. Um, usually a mower of this type, um, four to six years. Four to six years is probably a good number. So, um, depending on uh, wear and tear. Um, hopefully, during the during the slower growing seasons, we'll be able to rotate these mowers through. Um, if we don't have to have all four mowers out, we can, and we only need two or three, we could rotate them out so um, they're all getting quality um, about the same level of use instead of one mower going out all the time and the other one sitting in the shop. Follow up, go ahead. Is there any warranty with them? Um, Mr. York? There's a, a lifetime deck warranty, I believe, on these, or a five year deck warranty. On, I believe this one was a five year deck warranty. Um, and um, any other warranties would just be the normal like one year. Um. Anything further? Roll call. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? Yes. Alderman R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. That passes. Thank you. Thank That's you, the end of my report, Mayor. Thank you, Alderman. Finance Administration, Alderman Sosmarski. Mayor, we have an ordinance authorizing renewal of <coughs> aggregation for program for electric load. Is that your motion? That's my motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Let Brad take this over. Do we have any questions? Oh, if Mr. Hoover is here if we uh, have questions. Oh, that's the next item, the attorney saying. Okay. You want? All right. Do you guys want to speak? Go ahead, Brad. Well, so practically speaking, <coughs> excuse me. If item C two uh, is not going to be uh, awarded or passed, then the D two D two uh, correct. Then the passage of D one is somewhat self defeating. Um, so we kind of need to, unfortunately, know the answer to number two to make the. Uh, the proper choice on number one, but from a uh, but from a procedural standpoint, you have to pass number one first to get you to number two. So the cart before the horse, we have to know what the horses are to hook them up to the cart. So you want to give a presentation, or you want us to vote? Sure. So you want sure. to vote on number two? No, well, no we, we have to vote on number one first before we go to two. But we can vote on three. do you want? You want? Give me a, give me a roll call, please. Wait, what, what are we voting on? What are we voting on? The agreement. On three? On the ordinance. 
<laughs> we got a motion and a second. But then we go to the second one. You want to give your presentation first? That's, I thought it? you said. Can't we do them all? Your kind of confusing situation. Uh, Mr. Bunn, Mr. Bunn, yeah. I'm an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be brief. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the city in 2011 uh, adopted an ordinance uh, revising our code that allowed for the, uh, the uh, aggregate uh, program. What this does is extends that, continues that program. The next item on the agenda is the award of electric aggregation, and uh, those did go out to bid. And uh, there's a uh, there, there's been companies. We had six companies that uh, RFPs were sent to. Uh, there's a summary in your packet from uh, uh, Brad Wilson that identified the one of them MC2 did not re respond. Integris <coughs> did not respond. First Energy responded with a bid. Homefield Energy responded with a bid, and Verde responded with a uh, with a bid. And uh, there's going to be a recommendation, I assume, on the second. Uh, on the next item, which is D2, once you approve the ordinance, if you want to continue and there's been a cost savings realized, you want to continue the program, that's what you're voting on on this item. And then the next item of business will be uh, the D D2, which is to award it to the lowest bidder. So the item that's before you now is the uh, continuing the program for the uh, aggregate program. Alderman Roy Wesley. So we got a motion on for number one, D1, no. Right, there's a motion and a second, but if you guys want the presentation first. No, let's vote. That's what I said. Okay. Roll call. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? Yes. Alderman R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Woods? No. That passes. Item number two. Uh, I need a motion. I make a motion to. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> sorry, Mike. I took over for you. Sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Read the. Uh, number two, I did contract awards for the electric aggregation program. Yeah, that's my motion. That's your motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. Roy. You had a question, all the way? No, I was following you. you okay. Knows. But it was supposed to be Mike. <coughs> Go ahead, Brad. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> as we said uh, earlier today, uh, uh, by way of NIMEC and our good friend Mr. Hoover here, uh, solicited uh, Senate RFPs to six companies. Uh, the memo that was placed on your dais uh, earlier this evening showed that uh, two of the firms did not respond, three of the firms were higher than ComEd. And uh, there was one bidder that was below ComEd, which was Constellation, at Constellation Energy. Uh, so at this time, um, we're looking to um, approve the, the three-year rate lock with Constellation, which provided the, the lowest uh, rate per kilowatt hour and uh, for the longest term, uh, hopefully realize the greatest amount of savings. Um, and that would be, of course, pending final legal review, as I know uh, Attorney Bond's been looking at the contract uh, already today. Um, just real quick on the program, um, historically over the last 30 months uh, with First Energy, um, I know the smart meter people said they saved people $2 billion. Um, the 30 months with First Energy saved the residents and small business owners of Wooddale a little north of $1.8 million uh, in 30 months. Uh, so, uh, no, no, uh, so no small feat uh, for a town this size saved $1.8 million. So, uh, yeah, very, average, very proud of that. The average resident was $300, the average homeowner. Uh, the average homeowner was about three hundred dollars. Average. Brad, let me ask you. You said the attorney review. Do we need to change the motion? We still need to review something, Mr. Bond. Yeah, I've reviewed the uh, the draft contract. I'd like to have the uh, authorization, and I'd like to have it included in a motion that I have the uh, ability to review the final contract. So to make sure I've I've got the, exactly the the latest terms that are going to be approved by the council. Alderman Mr. Smarski, you agree? Yes. Alderman Wesley. I guess so. Okay. The motion is amended for attorney review. Any questions, Alderman <laughs> Eugene Wesley? Go ahead. You said it will save a homeowner's three hundred dollars. Is that a year? Um, Mr. Hoover, go ahead. Uh, what we've said is the average homeowner in Wooddale has saved three hundred dollars. 
uh, going back to the program's implementation. And Over the 30 months is what you're saying. Months. So what are we okay. looking to save here on this one? If we on this Mr. program, Hood. we're looking saving about 40 to $50 a year um, uh, for the next 12 months, which we, where we have the ComEd rate to compare against. You have a follow-up on the it? The, it's basically, it's not as huge a percent as it was the first contract. That is correct. When, when we started the program, the ComEd rate was artificially high, but it was a real number, but it was artificially high. They entered into some long-term contracts. Those fell off a year ago. Savings have narrowed, um, but... Uh, still a savings. Still a savings. Alderman, do you have a follow-up before I go to Alderman Woods? Oh, oh. Alderman Woods, go ahead. <laughs> The wheels are turning. All right. Yeah, can, uh, my question is to some of the other terms in the contract as far as kicking out when ComEd's price drops, how far are they going to drop, uh, penalties for people that are in that want to opt out later, are any of those things on the table? or Who's going to take that? Mr. Hoover? Go ahead. Uh, there are no uh, pen early termination penalties or withdrawal penalties. Um, residents can come and go as they please. Um, you, I think you asked about the ability to manage the program should the ComEd rate uh, be set underneath this rate during the term. Unfortunately, we don't have that. Uh, that is a term that's pretty much been uh, removed from all the suppliers. Uh, so as a result, the rates you would have would be the rates that would be in the program for the term you select. But again, the individual resident can come and go as they please. Go ahead, follow up. Yes. So when ComEd gives me my smart meter and they save me all my money, you're not going to be able to meet their price. Is that? Go ahead, Mr. Hoover. Well, the savings that ComEd's referring to are in the delivery charges. Uh, so all the operating costs of ComEd, all the transmission costs, that's all ComEd cost delivery. We're talking about the other half, the component, which is power. Um, so, well, what uh, the gentleman from Comed failed to mention, what was in the paper, that in two years the delivery charge is going to cost us more, if I remember right. When we start, well, yeah. Correct. When we started, when we started, it was like like this, but but right. but again. No, no, we understand. The rates have dropped considerably because those old Comed rates dropped off, um, and now we're starting to see it. Yeah. Right. Alder Wing, are you next? So uh, you, you already hit on part of my question, and that's the opt-in and out, because there are certain areas in Wooddale where homeowners enjoy um, or have lower rates because they have all electric within their unit or commercial buildings, that sort of thing. So I'm glad that we can opt in and out. Oh. If I can stop you, uh, a couple years ago when we started the program, that was exactly the case. Um, uh, over the last, I think, year or so, Commonwealth Edison has removed that uh, favorable rate for electric uh, uh, heat, oh. and they now have them uh, built at the same rate as everybody, as every other uh, ComEd user. So there's no distinguishment between regular homes okay. and electric heat homes. So we should actually have those residents and be look included. at their bills because they may have received an increase not knowing. Well, that's been phased in over years, but if they, yeah, and then what we'll do is we'll include them in the in the renewal of the program. Okay, well, we'll, we'll call a few of them and check that out. You have a follow-up? That was my follow-up. So those that have opted out currently and then the transition to the new contract, how will, will they continue to be opted out, or literally they're going to be in and they got to opt out again? They, they will have to opt out again. So if somebody opted out 30 months ago, um, they will receive another letter explaining the program, and yes, they will have to opt out again. Um, it's not the intent to annoy people, um, yeah. but the intent is to bring everybody into the program who's moved into the municipality over the last 30 months. They're on the ComEd rate. Uh, ComEd does not distinguish or have a, a placekeeper, a placeholder in their file saying they opted out. Um, so as a result, we go out, we, we, we pull the ComEd uh, users, and a small percentage are those folks who opted out 30 months ago. If I may follow up. Yes, go ahead. So, so are we looking at this taking effect in July? Is that when it would happen? Uh, I believe Mr. it's the very end of July, correct, is when the very end of July is when the, 
when the conversion will take place. So to be fair, 30 days later when you'll receive the first bill, which would be the you know beginning of September, end of August. So Mr. Mayor, along those lines that um, as a city, are we going to have um, information out to the residents? Like we I did already uh, in discussed that with the finance director. We discussed possibly a robocall, you know, reverse 911, maybe something in the water bill. Right. Some, uh, we have newsletter information uh, uh, that who we can company, provide you. Who the company is going to be. So they yeah. actually uh, yesterday at the senior club, there was a lot of questions on this. I explained it to them. I told them we would have an outreach and would let them know who the company is if we chose somebody. And if they wanted to opt out, they had every, they could do anything they like. If Other it, if you I have might something just, else? Go ahead. If I might just add one last thing. Uh, just so I know that rates are going up. I know that that's always hard to digest. Um, but just to be fair, uh, currently the way the pricing is set up, pricing is municipality by municipality. They have different profiles. Uh, we are returning back approximately one out of four municipalities <coughs> that we've aggregated to the ComEd rate because we can't beat the ComEd rate. So I'm very pleased to have these rates available to you um, and uh, so that there are there will be 40 to $50 of savings where many other communities are, are foregoing those and going back to the ComEd rate. Right. If you, everybody remembers, two months ago, we did bid it out and we rejected all bids because it was higher. And that's why we rebid again just before it ended. Alderman Jacob. A uh, couple quick questions. I, I had several seniors uh, call and complain about being kind of harassed by people trying to get them to go to change their carrier. So the people do, don't have to do anything that opted in before. Is that correct? Mr. Hoover. Yeah, to be clear. Um, uh, the village, uh, the city, or uh, any our supplier, Constellation, by the way, who's owned by the same company as ComEd, um, will not contact residents uh, individually on the phone, or will they come, they will not come to their door. So the only way that we will communicate with residents is uh, through the mail. And if a resident does nothing, they will be included in the rollover of the program. So it's an opt-out program that if they want to <coughs> not participate, then they'll have to return the little uh, the, the note. But if they do nothing, they'll be included. So again, if somebody comes to the door and says, you have to sign up or you have to do this, you have to do that to be part of the program, that's incorrect. And if I can leave one last comment is that for any resident talking to, and if you talk to anybody uh, who is trying to solicit your business, I would encourage them not to hand the bill, uh, but to make sure that they do not uh, provide their account number to anybody who's soliciting either individually or on the phone. Uh, a, an account number is all somebody needs to transition your account with or without your permission. So the unethical um, solicitor could get that account number regardless of what you say and, and switch your account later. So have all the conversations you want. We encourage people to shop and do whatever they want to do. That's fine. They can come and go in our program as they please. But just for Primarily for uh, for the seniors, we encourage you not to give out account numbers. Alderman Jacob, follow up. Go ahead. Uh, since we are doing this, I'm assuming the homeowners that are getting calls now, seeing the com competitions and see that we're opting into this, that should probably die down a little bit. I'm hoping. Mr. Hoover. Um, we hope, but it seems to me that that with the publicity. Um, is when the calls are focused on communities. So my guess is, uh, you know, within the next month or so, you will see things die down for sure. But it's just the fact that it's coming up because we're talking about it, because they'll see information about it. Unfortunately, I think the average citizen is a little, still is getting up the learning curve. And so I think some folks may seize on that opportunity. Thank you. Alderman Carolina. So when the residents get their bill, it won't be a Commonwealth Edison bill anymore. Uh, Mr. In, Hoover. Uh, incorrect. It will, uh, the program bills through Commonwealth Edison. Uh, it will still continue to bill through Commonwealth Edison, has been for the last 30 months. On the bill, as the previous gentleman said, there's basically two main sets of charges. One's the power and the other is the comet delivery charge. Uh, in the power, it will say power is provided by uh, currently says first energy at the rate and then, and then starting in the bills that residents receive at the end of September, end of August, 
it will change that little byline and it'll say received by constellation provided by constellation at the rate. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Woods, you had another question, go ahead. Correct. Uh, <coughs> I want to go back to the rate. I mean, what did we have? One, two, three, four, five, six people bid it, two didn't respond, the other three were higher, one barely beat ComEd's rate, and the person that beat it is the parent company or a subsidiary of uh, ComEd? Con so Mr. Hoover. The, the, the short question is, you know, what's the likelihood of going through this whole contract without this rate going in, being there's nothing to keep you locked into this? Go ahead. I'm sorry, ask the question again? Well, again, if the rates dropped, right, you're, you're not going to honor the, the contract, is that correct, based on what you were saying? No, before? he's not going to match. He won't match. He's well, going to honor the contract, like, but he won't like, match Robbie, the lower price. Right, you won't match. Right? Bad choice of words. <coughs> correct. Okay. Thanks. That's and and if Go you ahead. want my if you want my first of all just to be clear I am a consultant I'm not with Constellation I'm not with any of these uh, so to be clear um, in my opinion uh, we do expect the ComEd rate to stay at roughly the same level for 24 months and then we do expect to see a drop in year three um, but it's if, at at seven three four I feel comfortable suggesting that you'll be you know, you'll be okay with that rate. Now, I can't, con and that's the reason I say that we expect a drop is there's some regulated transmission charges embedded in these prices. We know there's going to be a, some drop in year three. What I can't give an opinion on is where the power markets, the commodity markets, are going to are going to trend over the next three years. Um, but absent of that, um, you know, I, assuming they stay relatively constant, I would say that this is a, a competitive rate and you'll increase your savings for the two years uh, getting to that third year. Thank you. Andy, Alderman Winger. Thank you. In, in the write-up, it talks about a ComEd blended rate. Um, it is at an average of three years, and if so, what is the charge per year? Go ahead. Okay. We'll try and keep everybody awake here. Um, it's a one-year rate. Commonwealth Edison releases their rates annually. They, for the first time, have the ability, they will reset that rate in the fall. So they really, they just released it. It's from starting, uh, starting excuse me, June 1 through May 31st. They, the four months, uh, the summer months, they have announced two of the three components in that power rate. Okay, and those two components uh, are 7.596 cents. Okay, that component will be reset in the fall for the last eight months based upon a lot of factors that ComEd will defer until then. In addition to those power and transmission rates that we just talked about, the 7.596 cents, there is a monthly charge that a resident who takes power from Commonwealth Edison. Uh, pays a separate line item and it's it's a monthly fluctuating amount uh, and it's capped at a half a cent positive or negative for the last three years it's average 0.33 cents so that's why we say when you put all that together what everything we know everything we're estimates we're saying the average comed rate over the last 12 months my best guess is 7.81 cents One more question. Go ahead, Alderman Woods. This one's for staff, for, for Brad, because I'm reading the, the memo, uh, and it just you know concerns me that nobody, only one person could beat it. Nobody's even close. You know, typically there's some people in the mix, so uh, you know, I'm slightly skeptical. But as I read this, based upon those numbers. This is the, the staff memo. It would appear that the rate of, it would appear, of 7.34 from Constellation appears to be more appealing rate than compared to ComEd's rate going forward. You know, I'd feel better even if this memo said their rate is lower, you know, instead of all the uh, appears and compared to and possibly, you know, more definitive would make me feel a little better. Do you want to? talk to that at all or mr. Wilson I can sure um, 
Just in a pure analytic sense, uh, 734 is lower than 748, so that's a better rate. So you're saving, you would save the uh, 0.14 per kilowatt hour, just right out of the box. Um, you know, the, the where I said appear is because I know, you know, you only have, you have six people bid, there's one coming back, and it's a sister company. So of course there's going to be some built-in cynicism w with the results, uh, which is why I took a softer approach and didn't want to, to go more hammer style and kind of more a smoother approach. Um, like I said, it, it appears on the surface to, to be a better rate, and also in speaking with Mr. Hoover, um, knowing that the rate is going to uh, theoretically uh, depress and deflate a little bit in the third year, I didn't want to put a firm that's going to be a better rate for three years, and then in year three, ComEd comes in at 733, and somebody pulls this memo out and says, oh, you told us two years ago it was always going to be better. So. So is it not going to be better for the three years? Mr. Wilson. That's, that's I think, Go ahead. I think all our crystal balls are a little foggy well, we, on that we, third year. Well, we, factually, all we know the ComEd rate for is for four months. We have an indication for the last eight months. In addition to that, there's a monthly fluctuating part. So we go out 12 months, okay? Um, ComEd doesn't release anything longer than a year. Okay. Thank you. Brad, basically you'll be monitoring that situation, so if they do fall below, we'll be able to uh, get the word out to the residents. Correct. Yeah, we're in constant uh, communication with Mr. Hoover, uh, both for this program and the city uh, auction programs that we have as well. So we're... Okay. Anything further? Trevor Roll call. Alderman Cantilano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? No. Alderman R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Woods? No. Two no's. That passes. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Mike. Alderman Mr. Smarsky. Number three, I have a resolution seeking to approve a memo of understanding with the Park, Wooddale Park District for the purchase, use, and care of a movie projector system. That is my motion. Second. Do we have a dollar amount? Oh, Mr. Manager, Mr. Mermos. Just wanted to make a, a quick comment. The uh, committee last time we discussed this had a uh, couple of concerns. They wanted to see the actual uh, system specs and um, the um, a mandate that the park district would allow the city to keep um, our typical dates which are usually in July however this year in June and they agreed to all the um, all the points that the committee made last time we discussed this and additionally executive director uh, Matt Elman from the park district is here tonight if you guys have any questions he's he's kind of the one heading up the project so do we have any questions we have a motion and a second yes, I do. roll call Alderman Cantalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazara? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? <coughs> Alderman R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Wood? Yes. That passes. Number four, I have a resolution. Thank you, Sorry. Sorry. A resolution seeking to approve an agreement between the City of Wooddale and GovHR USA LLC for the organi organizational assessment of the City of Wooddale's staffing and operations in the not to exceed amount of $27,000. That is my motion. Second. 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 Questions? Oh, you do, Wesley, go ahead. Mr. Mayor, I have a, a couple of concerns, but I, I don't think it should be done in open session. I just believe it. Direct them to the attorney after the meeting. Any other questions? Roll call. Alderman Cantalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazara? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? No. Alderman R. R. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Winger? No. Alderman Woods? No. That passes. Three no's. Mm -hmm. That concludes your report? That concludes it. Thank you.
three. No, you got that. Yeah. Okay. Under other business, we have item number three <coughs> of the consent agenda. Mr. We Mayor. need a motion. I'll make a motion. Second. Is that uh, upon further review of the attorney? Yes. Alderman Woods? Alderman Smarski? Yes. Okay, a motion a second. Question. Do we to Question approve is the, to approve the Kim construction. We have a question. Hold on one second, please. And that's a not to exceed amount of two hundred fifty thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars. Alderman Woods? Correct. Alderman Smarski? Yes. Okay. Motion a second. Alderman Eugene West, uh, guys. Mr. Mayor, so what we're doing is we're directing the attorney to review these documents and to see if it's valid if, or, or not valid. To see and, if they should be disqualified, basically. Right. But my question to you is why would we even vote on this tonight until we know for sure? Mr. Byrne. So what I'm doing is I'm giving attorney and staff the go ahead without the council approval. No, the motion states upon attorney review, like Mr. Bond said earlier. Again, but will it come back to the council after attorney review? Okay. If it qualifies, it will not come back to us. If it's disqualified, Mr. Bond, you want to go ahead? Right, because you've already had a, your consultant has already done the vetting process and has reviewed these and has made a determination that it's the, uh, they are not disqualified. What I will be doing is bringing this to their attention to make sure that this was uh, considered and then I'll re do an independent review to determine whether or not under our specs and under state statute if this renders this company uh, ineligible and disqualifies them from being a bidder. If that's the case, it will come back to you. If after the consult uh, consultation with the uh, engineer and my legal review, they are not uh, disqualified and are not ineligible to uh, bid on it, it will not come back to you. It will be approved uh, assuming the vote is in the affirmative this evening. You have a follow-up? Go ahead. I, I have a follow-up. So if it does come back that this company is disqualified, does that mean, does that terminate the contract with, with RJN knowing that they did not do the till, 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 and, and produce this information? Mr. Bond, you want to respond? To yeah, that? I mean, it, 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 no, it would not automatically uh, do that. And I, again, I'm, my assumption is based on uh, working with them on the other contractors, is that they did, in fact, do the due diligence, and this would not render the contractor ineligible. If that's not the case, it would be brought back to you because uh, you'll have to award the contract to another contractor, uh, and then uh, you can deal with uh, RJN if, in fact, that they did not uh, uh, discharge their responsibilities under their contract. Thank you. Alderman Roy Wesley. Is there a big rush to get this done? Or can we just wait for the attorney's review and make a motion to table on this? We have a motion. As long as the attorney does his due diligence, I think we're going to be okay. I don't see any reason to wait. Mr. Bond? Right. And we've had uh, inquiries before, and we've, this is the process that we've taken. And once those inquiries were uh, addressed, uh, the, the matter you know, what proceeded or was returned back to you. So uh, there's no reason to delay it if uh, this can be determined. It's either going to not render them ineligible, it's going to render them ineligible. If it's not ineligible, the contract goes forward with the approval this evening. If they are ineligible, it will come back to you because you will have to award it to a, uh, another contractor, so. Alderman Jacob, go ahead. Along the lines of what uh, Alderman Wesley just said, wouldn't it be better just to table this since there's so many questions about this? Mr. Bond. And there's really only one question. The question is, does a, uh, a complaint uh, with the Department of Labor render for prevailing wage, uh, render the, uh, the contractor ineligible. And I will tell you from my legal experience, it does not. So I don't think there's a lot of questions. The question is whether or not that was taken into consideration by RJN. So that's really the only, only issue. Alderman Woods. Uh, Pat just answered my question. Okay. This is just a question of law. Right. Anything further? Roll call. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Sigmarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? No. Alderman R. Wesley? Abstain. Alderman Moyer? Yes. Alderman Woods? Did I say Alderman Woods? 
You did. Um, <laughs> yes. That passes. Mr. Bond. Yeah, and just so everyone knows, if in fact these uh, are determined not to render the uh, company ineligible, they are obligated by state statute and our, our ordinance to uh, pay prevailing wage. And the Department of Labor has a division that oversees that. There's organizations that uh, ensure that happens and the, uh, the, the uh, project uh, is going to be, prevailing wage is going to be paid as part of that. Alderman Woods. Can I, Pat, do you know, I mean, as part of our, our contract, is the, our engineer, i.e. RJN, don't they monitor these payrolls? Isn't that part of this, or is this not covered under that? Contract? Mr. Bond. Yeah, generally they would. There's a certified payroll that's required when a public project is being uh, conducted. Okay, thank you. All right, next approval list of bills, June 5th. Alderman Sismarski. We have a list of bills here, June 5th, uh, $1,506,639.36. That is my motion. Second. Okay, a motion, a second. Do I have any questions? I have no questions, sir. Can we stop and wait for you to find some? No <laughs> questions? I have a question. For old time's sake? <laughs> Alderman Catalano. <laughs> I'm just. <laughs> Hi guys. On the uh, page ten. Go ahead. On the uh, Hartman landscaping, we have how many? We got three lots. I'm sorry. Go ahead. What I want to know is uh, how big are those lots? The three lots for the yeah. two hundred and fifty dollars a lot, or yeah. whatever it was. Mr. York, you're going to respond. I want to defer to uh, Ms. Hennigan. Hennigan. Oh, because they call them out. Can right. I, can I say something? Hold on. Wait. No, let's get the question. answer first. There are the empty lines. Are the ones that aren't those are. Yeah, aren't those? Weed lots. Go ahead. Yeah. They're weed lots. We can we can get that information to you. Um, normally, it's just a it's a flat rate, two hundred and fifty dollars, I think, to come out on any. On any weed lot? That's correct. Yes. So wouldn't it be cheaper in-house to take care of that? Mr. Well, York. That would be wonderful if we could do that. And um, for one, uh, we asked um, the Community Development Department if they could take care of that for us, since that's kind of a hit or miss thing. Um, and going on to, going on to pub, uh, private property with our equipment. Um, so we had asked for them to uh, take care of this. Mr. Mermis, maybe could help us out. Mr. Mermis, go ahead. Typically, what, we, what we'll do is we'll get a company in there just to get the nuisance of it away, and then we lean the property back. Mr. Bond. And that's actually a cleaner way because if you don't do it and you do it in house, then they determine what the uh, staff cost was, the salary, and uh, the, the lien becomes challengeable. If you contract it out, you've got an invoice from the, uh, from the vendor and there's no, no dispute as long as you show an invoice and a payment of that invoice, that's a valid lien under the, uh, under the lien statute because you can't impose a, uh, a weed lien against the property. There's also some priorities now that weed liens take in foreclosures that they do have to be paid, so it's a much cleaner way of doing it than somebody saying, well, if you deduct out what they would have otherwise done, the fact they were getting paid salary anyway, so it's really here's what the actual cost should be as opposed to saying this is what it costs to do. So it's, it's an efficiency issue, and it's also there's a, a legal component to it. it. makes it a much cleaner lien. Thank you. Any other questions? Roll call. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? <coughs> yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. And that passes. We have no executive session, no items to be referred. Need a motion to adjourn? Uh, I have other business. Make that motion. Well, hold on one second. You I have, got, you have I item to be referred? On, no, I got a question on other business. That was before. We, oh. we did other business. Okay. That's fine. I just want to know why uh, Northwest is parking on private property over by Ethan Woods. Mr. Bond? It's just direct it to the manager, he'll make the call. 
I try to ask him. He says it's directed to the attorney. All right. Need a motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion. I already made the motion. Do I have a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries.